basketball is a team sport and to have people around me that let me play and let me be myself and then teammates that can catch my passes. Although I did hit a lot of people in the head. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Players Podcast presented by the EuroLeague Players Association. I am your host, Kyle Hines. Today, we have a very special guest, um, a legend, a pioneer. Um, I want to say of not just women's basketball, but all basketball. Um, her accolades and her resume is, is, is a long list, I guess you can say. I mean, we could spend all day kind of, you know, just just breaking down that, but I mean, she is a, a WNBA champion, um, a member of the all the WNBA all-time anniversary teams, um, inducted into the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame. Um, her her European resume may be even even you know even more greater than you know her WNBA WNBA resume. She's won championships in Poland and France and Russia and Czech Republic. Um, won the Euro Cup championship and 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 won the the the, the women's Euro League championship and that is the legendary Tisha Penitero. Tisha, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Kyle. And oh my God, I'm blushing after all of that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you accomplished it, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes you don't realize it until people kind of say it out loud. I always say I always played to be the best player that I could be. I I didn't necessarily knew what they meant but I just wanted to look back and have no regrets in my career. And now sitting here, you know, talking to you, I definitely can say that um, I did everything and, and then some more than I, that I could ever imagine. So definitely. I mean, your, your journey, your story, your career, um, both on and off the, the basketball court is definitely inspirational to, to a lot of people. And like I said, I, I really appreciate you, you know, taking the time. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of yours um, on many levels for, for many of the things that you accomplish and the many things that you that you do and continue to do, um, you know, in, in your life in general. Yeah, thank you. Now, I, I want to take it back all the way to the beginning. Um, yeah. You know, I, I listen to a lot of interviews and a lot of different things that you do. And, and you you always speak to kids and you tell them to dream big. Now, I wonder, you know, when you were growing up in Portugal, you know, what were your first dreams and what were your first aspirations? Yeah, so growing up in Portugal, for those that don't know, it's definitely a soccer country and a man's yeah. soccer country, you know, women's basketball. And we're talking about back in the uh, early 80s, uh, there's no internet, there's nothing. So all I can think about is playing basketball. I fell in love with the game at the age of five, six, because I have an older brother that also played mm -hmm. and my dad played and then coached. So it was love at first sight. I was also very lucky because I had a playground right across the street from my house where I spent most of my days um and my dream was actually to come to the states uh mm -hmm. for at a very young age i knew that this was the the place where i could get better where i could you know grow as, as a player and also as a woman um so that was my my first big dream is to to kind of fly away from from my country from from my comfort zone and try to come this way and see what a basketball would be all about and um, i'm glad that i did it was the best uh, decision of my life and it completely changed you know my life and also my career now i want to rewind a little bit um you said that you know that your your dad was a coach and your brother was a player now when you first this wanted to play basketball, you know, following them and, and following their footsteps. Um, you know, what what was their reaction? Like you said, because you come from Portugal where it's a it's a, a mainly a, a soccer, you know, fo football country. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, at the time, like, you know, women's basketball isn't necessarily popular at the time, um, not like it is today. So what was their reaction? Well, they were supportive and, and that's number one, you know, I was kind of a pain in the butt. I was always following my brother. He was trying to, you know, talk to girls and then here I am like trying to like glue to his hip because I was, was trying to play with him and uh, yeah. go to the playground. Most of the times I was the only girl amongst a bunch of boys. And in the beginning, I obviously didn't think I could play and I was very skinny and, you know, younger than everybody. So they were even scared that I would play because they, they were scared that I was going to get hurt. Um, but the my 
my family support was, I mean, obviously uh, one of the main reasons why I had the confidence to leave and to really follow my dreams. Um, and my brother was my number one fan and my protector. And because of him, I know that I actually followed my dream of coming to the States. He had that dream and he never ended up coming, but then he kind of passed it on to me and I was able to, um, you know, to come this way. But, uh, you know, a lot of stereotypes, you know, girls can play what you're yeah. doing here, go home and play with the dolls, you know, all that stuff. But uh, slowly they actually were like, oh, you know, she's not that bad. And I was <laughs> slowly starting to get accepted and I was able to play with the boys. And I think that also changed a little bit of um, of the way that I played. You know, yeah. the boys are, you know, stronger, more athletic, faster. And that's why I kind of developed my passing skills because I didn't want to get my, my shot it's, blocked. That so. makes sense. That makes a lot of yeah. sense. Yeah. <laughs> That makes a lot of sense that that were you ever deterred about, you know, like, you know, going to the playground, you know, every day, um, you know, I guess, you know, people stereotypically stereotyping you or maybe not picking you. Were you ever just like deterred and like, you know, maybe it's like, you know, I'm just going to do something different or just like you said, where did where that kind of like yeah. confidence, you know, at such a young age, because, you know, most young yeah. girls or young people at all just don't have that type of confidence to kind of continue on. Yeah, I kind of just waited my turn. I, I remember them playing five on five, and every time they would go down the court, I would go and shoot in the, the basket, and then they would come and I would run away because they were going <laughs> yeah. too fast. And, but I would dribble, I would sit down and watch them play and dribble between my legs. Um, so I always had a basketball with me. And, um, you know, so I, it, it is true. You know, sometimes you get turned down and you, you start getting upset, and I could have just grabbed my ball and went home. But I stayed around and I just kind of patiently waited my turn, and they could see that I was also getting better. Mm -hmm. And so Sometimes they would have like only nine player and they, nine players and they look at me like, do you want to run with us? And I'm like, yeah, you know, so patiently, you know, patience is a virtue. And, you know, I was patient enough to, to kind of stick around. And, uh, and I think uh, you paid off. Now, who were your besides your brother and besides your dad, who were your early basketball influences? Now, this is we're talking 1994. I mean, even younger than that night in the early, yeah. late 90s. Yeah, like, so. There wasn't YouTube. There wasn't NBA streaming. There wasn't I mean, even yeah. in Portugal. Portugal doesn't have necessarily the, the top flight, you know, European leagues. Right. Um, so where were you? Who were and what were your early basketball influences? So growing up, I only had two channels, right? And yeah. Every Sunday at 3 p.m., uh, they would show an NBA game like tape delayed. So uh -huh. every Sunday, I'll be on my couch with my brother and my dad watching the NBA game, that the game of the week, whatever mm -hmm. that game was. Uh, and like you mentioned, there's no internet, so I don't have YouTube. I don't. I cannot research anything. So all I can see is what I see on TV every Sunday, as far as yeah. you know, the, the, and the NBA. So Magic, obviously, uh, and then Michael Jordan were my favorite players. Um, Magic also because he was a point guard and he was obviously an, an amazing passer. So, but those were my idols growing up. And it's it's sad to say, but I didn't really have any women yeah, um, that I idolized, uh, especially on the on the on the basketball court um because we didn't have access to that so um so yeah magic and jordan were definitely my guys now you decided to go to america you said that was your dream in 94 mm -hmm. you wanted to you know you committed to go to old dominion university now my question is how did that process even start um you know how were you how did old dominion find you and you know were there yeah. other options were there other choices and um you know and and how did your parents because like i said i, I went to school I was, I'm born in, I was born in New Jersey and I went to school in, in, in North Carolina. And my mom was like, you're not going anywhere. Like you're going to school down the street. So I can't imagine yeah. at such a young age, especially, you know, you know, how, how, what were your parents thinking, you know, to, you know, when you said, yeah, you know, how, how I ended up at Old Dominion is actually a really cute story that mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know about. Remember, like, I cannot do any research. I know I want to come to the States, but I really don't know how to go about it, right? So I was 16 and I was playing with the national team, with the Portuguese national team, and we were competing in the Division I uh, mm -hmm. league in Portugal. So I'm playing against this team and they had an American player. Mm -hmm. And she comes up to me after the game and I'm like, hey, you're pretty talented. Like, you should go to the States. And I said, I want to. I, I just don't know how. And she was like, give me your number. So at this time, I'm like giving them my parents' home number, you know, the uh -huh. rotary phone. Yeah, like, yeah. I like <laughs> I gave her my number and a couple of years later, she became the assistant coach at Old Dominion. So wow. she remembered me. Yeah. And she told the head coach, Hey, you have to go to Portugal to see this girl play. Um, so she calls me and I'm, my mom answers the phone and she actually kind of learned how to speak Portuguese. She was like super smart. She went to yeah. Dartmouth and she spoke Chinese and all like all this crazy stuff. So, uh, so she's like, 
may I speak to Tisha? And my mom was like, hey, somebody with an accent is like asking about you. So I answered the phone and she's like, I don't know if you remember me. I'm Allison Green. Um, I play for Amadora. And, uh, and I'm like, yeah, I remember. She's like, well, I'm coach now at Old Dominion and we want to recruit you. I was like, what? So yeah, my head, then the head coach and the assistant coach, another assistant coach came to Portugal. They brought like this big binder with a presentation and it was really, really cool. Um, so it was, I don't know, perfect timing. Again, I can know, I can do any research on Old Dominion. I have yeah. no idea they are division one, two, three, there's, like there's no Wikipedia, there's no Google, there's nothing. No, nothing. So I'm like, okay, well, they want me, I'm going. So I came on a visit actually. So they mm -hmm. paid for me to come on a visit. And they show me around. They took me to Virginia Beach. They, they took me to, to eat seafood. I'm like, okay, I'm sold. I'm coming. Yeah. Um, and it ended up being an amazing experience. I mean, we were uh, we didn't play in a very good conference, but then I brought two friends with me, mm -hmm. um, and we were like one of the best teams in, in the country for for like three years. So we worked out perfectly. Again, the timing of everything, a little bit of luck that you have to have sometimes, um, and it worked out perfectly. This is 1994. And you know, you're pulling up to Old Dominion for the very first time. This isn't LA, this isn't Miami, this isn't New York. This is, you know, a small, I shouldn't say small, but it's a small city in Virginia. How did you deal with the culture shock? Like I said, I, as an overseas basketball player, you know, we always talk about the culture shock of going to America to go to Europe and how, you know, Americans deal with it. But how did you deal with that first week? I don't know if you being, you know, there in ODU, did you have any like homesickness or did you, did you, you know, and, and what, what kind of helped you, you know, through those times during that first month? Yeah, so I definitely was homesick, but I try to be open minded, try to make new friends. I mean, obviously, I relied a lot on my teammates uh, to show me around and to take me out. And I didn't want to go into like my little cocoon and just be homesick because that would make my life so much harder. And that's not what I was going to be there for. So uh, but like my first culture shock, if you can say that is like I used to dress up every day to go to school, like, <laughs> <laughs> try to like wake up early shower to yeah. get all of my nice clothes lay them out the night before and then everybody would have flip-flops and just like sweaters and just like I was like okay I guess people they, and they'd be looking at me like I was like what are you doing like why are you yeah. dressed like that <laughs> so clearly that was my freshman like first semester then I adjusted but uh that was like the first thing and I thought everybody was super nice they welcomed me with open arms um and about being homesick you know remember there's no internet no FaceTime yeah. no WhatsApp nothing so I used to write letters to my parents and mm -hmm. send them in the mail it was super expensive to call I used to buy these calling cards but they were like super expensive <laughs> so I used to write letters and by the time my parents would get, get the letters two weeks later all the news were old news but um but yeah that's back in 99 1994 you know the internet was just slowly start you know yeah. coming around so, up. but yeah different times yeah did you uh was there something about like American culture or something like in Virginia that you um, that surprised you or just something like, you know, was it like a special type of food or like, or something like that? Like, you know, when you went there, you were like, wow, like, this is amazing. Like, you know, where did, where has this been all my life? Well, I, I try to stay away from fast food because I realized that uh, that was kind of like what everybody ate. Yeah. And then I was like, you know, in the beginning it's like, oh, cool. McDonald's is cool, whatever. But then I'm like, no, this is definitely not what I want to put in my body. So I was just cook all the time at home. And all of my teammates used to go to, you know, fast food all the time. So I try to control it because I could tell that, you know, they talk about the 15 pounds that usually freshmen put, <laughs> put on and I didn't want to be part of that statistic. So, uh, but yeah, I thought everybody was super and I just walking around campus people would be like good morning and I'm like do I know him do I know her you know mm -hmm. people would just greet each other and that's part of their American culture and you know back in Europe you only say hello to people that you know so yeah. that was also like something that I had to get used to but I thought that people were were amazing and and um and super friendly now I'm guessing um you know like you said you 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 had so many accolades in, in college you know two-time all-american you guys got to the the final the finals game of uh, your junior year and you know, you had so many different, you know, accolades. Um, how did it feel? Because I'm guessing in Portugal, you know, you you were kind of, I'm guessing you were unknown because like you said, women's basketball wasn't necessarily, uh, you know, super popular in a, in a, you know, soccer country. But going to ODU, which is, you know, fairly a small school to now, you're on the, the, the highest stage possible of women's basketball. So what did that feel like for you and your teammates? 
it was a little bit surreal. And remember, like, because I'm not, an, I was an American, I really didn't, it took me a while to understand how things work, like what it means to be top 25, what it means to like, to really understand like all of the programs and the ones that are really good. And when you beat Stanford and everybody goes crazy, it's like, oh, that's why, you know? So <laughs> it took me a while to understand like how things work and, you know, playing conference games versus non-conference. But to me, I didn't care. I'm like, I'm here to win and to get better. So it didn't matter who we played against, but, uh, you know, I was just, just trying to win, but, um, and it's, it's crazy because, you know, when I'm leaving Portugal, like, I don't know if I'm going to be successful. I don't know if I'm going to start. I don't know anything. All I know is that I'm going to go and I'd rather go and fail than never go and then have regrets later. So, um, so yeah, I, I started my freshman year, which sometimes is not normal. Um, and everything kind of went smoothly. I, I felt like practices were like three hours long. Sometimes we'd get a water break. I'm like, I'm thirsty. Hello. <laughs> you know, so I had to like, sometimes we wake up at five o'clock in the morning because we had to lift and practice before we go to school. So I just had to adjust to like small things. But at the end of the day, I just kept thinking, you know, this is why I'm here. Here and I'm here to get better and not every day with speeches and cream some days I would cry because I'm like what am I doing here I miss my family but I just kept you know thinking about the big picture and that was to get my degree and then just to grow as a woman and, a, and as a player now you just you just kind of mentioned you said your big picture at the time there was no WNBA it was just kind of you know it just kind of came around I think 97 um so what were your aspirations when you got to school in 94 what were your kind of like your next step aspirations? Was it to, you know, play professionally overseas in Europe or what was kind of like your mindset, um, you know, during that time? Yeah, my goal was to get my degree, you know, just grow and then go back and play in Europe. I always wanted to play in Italy. I ended up playing for Parma. I played for uh, Sesto San Giovanni, which is like close to Milan. Yeah. And uh, and I play uh, one year in Umberti di and and I just wanted to go and play in Europe. I knew that I didn't want to really go back to Portugal. I wanted to venture and just try other uh, places in Europe. But again, uh, the timing of everything was perfect. I was already in school when the WNBA came around. It was right after the 96 Olympics. There were, you know, um, everybody was talking about it. They went undefeated. They got the gold medal. And I think that kind of propelled the, the start of the WNBA. Um, David Stern at the time was the commissioner of the NBA and he really wanted to, to have a women's league. And I think he's the, the main reason why we, we started. Um, and, um, you know, again, because I was here and I was being successful in college, it was much easier for teams and GMs and, you know, even the league in itself to, to watch me play. So, uh, again, I definitely didn't have that dream because the WNBA wasn't around. But then I was like, you know what, maybe I'm able to, to play in the WNBA. And, you know, I ended up being the number two draft pick and play 15 years. So um, the rest is history. But the timing of everything was also perfect. Now, going back to the, the draft, well, the first question I have is, did you have a decision to make? Because at the time there were the, the WNBA and it was the ABL. And then also, I'm sure you were getting, um, you know, interest from overseas teams as well. So was it a kind of a decision that you had to make, you know, and, and what, how did you go about making that decision? Yeah, great question. I mean, I did. The ABL was around. A lot of people don't even remember that, but it was right at the time that I came out that I, I could pick the WNBA and the ABL. So I was being heavily recruited. Yeah. Um, the, the ABL actually offered me m way more money. I remember um, for those that are curious, they offered me 250 and I'm like, nope. I want to play in the WNBA really? because of the game, because of everything. I remember the WNBA brought me and my agent into New York. We went to the headquarters. They took me to um, a few Broadway shows and uh, they, you know, I was just being, you know, recruited. And I was like, this feels good. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then my agent and I walked in and David Stern was sitting at the table and I'm like, yeah. whoa. <laughs> and I mean, just the aura of him and just being in the offices, the name, the fact that he was affiliated with the NBA, I just felt like that's who I wanted to play for. And again, I kind of betted on the right horse because the a ABL folded a, a couple years later. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was a tough decision because the ABL came on strong, but I'm like, no, I'm, I'm going to go with my gut this time. Now, draft night, uh, 1998, you yeah. mentioned before you were picked second by the Sacramento Monarchs. So set the scene. Tell us about, because I mean, everybody's excited about draft night. Everybody's excited about hearing your name call. So where was the draft? You know, do you remember? I seen the picture of the outfits and everybody like, you know, very, <laughs> very, very retro, 90s retro style. But, uh, you know, what was the, 
what was kind of that, that scene and that atmosphere like, you know, were, were you there with your family? Like, just kind of, you know, tell us a little bit about that, that whole experience. Yeah, so it was, uh, you know, this is like only the second time that we, we having a draft because the first one was in 1997. So he was in New Jersey in the, um, in Secaucus, uh, where the NBA has their offices and it was like fake live. So <laughs> actually when they said my name that I was going to go to Sacramento, I already knew. And I remember oh. them saying, when they say your name, you know, make sure you, you act surprised, but already knew because it's like fake delay or something. I can't remember exactly. Um, so by the time the Sacramento came around, and it's actually also like a really cool story. Uh, the Utah Jet, I mean, the Utah Stars had the first pick and mm -hmm. the coach and the GM at the time flew to Old Dominion and they say, hey, we're going to take you with the number one pick. And I'm like, I want to go to Utah. I was like, it's <laughs> You know, so I'm like thinking that, right? And yeah. they're like, no, I'm going to take you with the number one pick. I actually wanted to fall to third because the, the Mystics had the number three pick and okay, it was so closer to Norfolk. Close and, to you know, I didn't, yeah, I didn't want to go to the West Coast. I didn't know anybody. It's almost like start over again. So if I stayed on the East Coast, I could, you know, stay close to my school, my new friends, blah, blah, blah. So Utah told me, we're going to take you number one pick. And I'm like, okay, cool. And then pre-draft camp, they used to have this pre-draft camp in Chicago and this girl from Poland that I knew because I used to play against her with the national team. She was same year as me. She was seven two. And everybody thought it was like a typo, you know? Yeah. So, but she was really seven two and she was really good. So she ended up being the number one pick because Utah took her as the number one. And then I ended up going to Sacramento with the number two pick. So. So when you get to Sacramento and this, I'm sure this had to be a whole nother culture shift, um, you know, being in Virginia, now all of a sudden you're on the West coast. Um, so you get there, um, what was life like in Sacramento? And then was it, was it a difficult adjustment? Was a whole nother adjustment for you? Yeah, it was, I mean, completely. And I remember coming on the plane and I'm just looking around and all I see is cornfields. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> like, and then, uh, I remember landing and, uh, they had like a limo waiting for me. They took me to the gym. There was like a, a media, um, we had a media press, uh, like everybody was um, just asking me questions and then training camp started right away. But, um, you know, I actually enjoyed it because it was a really small town and I was really focused on just, you know, being the best pro that I could be. And it was perfect. There was no distractions. I mean, I was never like the really the party type or whatever, but I mean, there was nothing to do. It was really go to practice, come back, and then go to the games and come back. And obviously, I had to make new friends because I'm changing coasts. You know, I'm going from north of Virginia on the east coast all the way to the west coast. But um, but yeah, it, it was cool. I and mean, the WNBA was so demanding um, because we had like three, four games a week. Sometimes we had to travel, uh, practices, media, you know, all this stuff. And this is your job now, so you really have to be focused. And um, and you know, we just started the WNBA. We we want to to do well. So so we can continue on and um, and have a successful league. So uh, it was it was a good thing for me, and I loved Sacramento. And uh, when the team folded back in two thousand nine, I was actually heartbroken. You know mm -hmm. that that happened. Now I, I want to know because you're totally removed from everything in Portugal, right? Mm -hmm. So here you are, you're the number two pick of the WNBA draft. You had this you know amazing college career. You're a professional athlete, just that and the other. What were your parents thinking back home in Portugal? What were your like friends and everybody back in Portugal thinking like, you know, when you would talk, like I said, there was no YouTube, there was no internet. So there wasn't any of this, like where they could just click and they could just type your name and they could see everything you're doing. So um, you physically had to go back home and tell everybody. So what was people like thinking when you were like, you know, telling them like, oh, I'm this big star, basketball star. Over <laughs> the States. Like were people like, nah, get out of here. Or, you know, what was the reaction like? Yeah, the Portuguese media was was great. I mean, it's uh, you always had to compete with soccer, you know, mm -hmm. to get some type of, you know, just paper uh, cover or like to be on the news or whatever. But when I became the number two pick, I mean, the the whole Portuguese media was amazing. The whole mm -hmm. country, I, I felt the love. At this time, there's no social media, no, so nobody really can reach out to you directly. But yeah. I mean, when I went home, I mean, they they took me to like what do you call it, the, the Portuguese ESPN. I had interviews everywhere. People waiting for me at the airport so definitely um and the internet was already like starting so um but um but it, it was great and uh and the whole time that i played and uh, i always tried to make not just my family proud but my country proud i know a lot of times especially with the time difference in playing in sacramento people will be up until like three or four in the morning trying to watch the games live so i always played um with uh with portugal on my on my heart uh, and just try to do what i could to to make everybody proud 
your first WNBA game, you know, what was the feeling like, you know, when you officially put on that, you know, that, that Sacramento Monarchs jersey and you walking into, you know. Yeah, yeah with Lee Phoenix, I remember, and I play like crap. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, just a lot of nerves, uh, you know, big arenas, um, everybody's, you know, coming to see you. And, um, you know, we're playing against a team that has been established and they were really, really good. So, uh, and, you know, you play point guard. So it's it's tough because as a, as a rookie, you're trying to tell everybody what to do and just try to make sure that you do what you're supposed to do. And we were not very good. I mean, our first year, I think we only won eight games. Mm. Um, and, you know, I just uh, was so banged up because you really have no off season. You finish uh, college and you go right into the WNBA and I was playing a lot of minutes uh but yeah I mean it was um it was good it was I didn't start well I, I didn't I was so nervous and I had so many butterflies but uh but it was okay <laughs> what was your first um like kind of fan moment I guess you know playing against somebody like you know whether or not it was like Lisa Leslie or like you know I think you mentioned Cynthia Cooper or you know Cheryl Swoops like did you have like a fan moment like you know like I'm guarding you know this person like you know did that did that occur when you your first your first time in NBA? Yeah I think a little bit before the games even when you go through the scouting report and you yeah. hear these names that you've heard before and they're Olympians and they have gold medals and all this stuff and I you know but when the game starts you, you don't really think about that anymore but um I I would say Tina Thompson and Lisa Leslie were like the names and then you hear Dawn Staley and uh, she was in the ABL but then eventually she came to the WNBA somebody that uh, I didn't even know she was when I was in Portugal but then coming here and just hearing and obviously you look at uh, point guards because that was the position that I played and she's somebody that I've always looked up to um, so yeah it's it there was a lot of names out there that you can um, that you hear and you kind of I cannot believe that I'm about to guard her or I'm yeah. on the same court with her, you know, like when you really process everything and go back to your childhood growing up in Portugal. But, uh, but yeah, I never was intimidated. Once the ball went up, like I was, it was fair game. Yeah, I can, I can imagine that. Now I wonder, um, and this is a question that kind of just came, came to me, you know, you played and this is the second year of the league. Um, mm -hmm. As a league, the, the participants in the league in general, did you guys feel like any added pressure because like you are the pioneers of the league, you know, you're the, the, the starters, the trailblazers, you know, as you, I guess you could say, did it feel like any pressure, like, you know, to make this league successful? Like, you know, we have to, you know, do certain things in order to make the league successful or did it just kind of feel like you said, like, we're just going out, just kind of just playing. Yeah, I think it was in the back of our mind. I mean, it wasn't like, the number one thing that we thought about, but I think everybody unconsciously knew that we had to to be successful. We we always had appearances with season ticket holders and the fans. We had to sign autographs after the games. Like so, we went like the extra mile to make sure that you know we were uh, welcoming everybody and really uh, try to gain more fans. Um, so I think all of that was in the back of our mind, just to not just put a good product on the floor, but also off the court to, to be good people and, um, you know, good pros and really have an interaction almost like, you know, a friendship with uh, some of the, of the fans that came to the game. Now, Sacramento uh, fans, you were there during kind of at like the, the peak of, you know, the Sacramento, you know, fanfare I guess you could say with the Kings and with you with you as well you know the Arco Arena with the cowbells and you know, the arena going crazy so you know what was that atmosphere like um during that time I mean I remember you know kind of part of my childhood like you know watching the games and watching the sold out games like it was just incredible like I I couldn't imagine like I get goosebumps now just watching it on tv like actually being live and playing in front of there like what, what was that atmosphere like for you it was amazing. I mean, they were one of the best teams in the league. I mean, Chris Weber, you have Jason, um, um, I'm sorry, Jason, Jason Williams that everybody compared me to. Then you yeah. have Paige, you have Doug Christie, you have Bobby Jack. I mean, they, they were a really good team. And I mean, if it wasn't for Robert Horry, we probably, they probably would have won a championship. Uh, game six back in LA, uh, Vlade like tips the ball trying to yeah. get the rebound and he passes it like an assist to Robert Horry on top of the key. They, they would have won that game and then they could have gone into the finals to play the, the Nets. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think they, they could have won a championship, but the atmosphere was insane. I mean, you couldn't hear people like, I mean, it's, it was so loud in there and yeah, the cowbells. And I remember this, them going uh, behind Phil Jackson and he couldn't yeah. really do anything. It was so loud in there. I mean, he's at the time it was kind of a big arena, but it only is like 17,000 people. So it was from the jump, you know, until the end, it was like ridiculously loud in there. Now you guys won the championship in, in 2005. 
Um, and it was kind of almost like you said, like with the Sacramento LA rivalry and your rivalry with Sparks and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, what was it like to bring home that championship to Sacramento? Like you said, in the beginning, when you first got there, you guys were kind of weren't good, but you kind of, you know, continue to grind, continue to grind and continue to get better. Um, so what was that experience like of, you know, winning a world championship? Yeah, I, I think it was definitely the highlight of my career. I mean, you 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 win so many things, but um, um, but that I mean to to win in the the, the best league in the in the world, um, it's and because you've been heart, heartbroken so many times before you get to the playoffs, and then you play the Houston Comets, you play the Sparks, and at the time it was East versus West, so we had to get out of the West, which at the time I think it was the stronger um, yeah conference. So it was tough, you know, and it's like, okay, well, next year we try again. And then next year would come and we would lose again in the playoffs. So it was a lot of hard work. I think we were like all logged in. We, uh, we were a team that were like all defensive minded. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're able to, you know, to, to win the championship. And uh, it's the, it's definitely the pinnacle of, of my career and all the accolades that, that I got. I mean, that's definitely my favorite one. What was the celebration like? Oh, it was crazy because we had a chance to to win at home. So, yeah. um, and it came down like we were up by three, uh, and uh, we were playing Connecticut. And uh, Nikisha Sale shot a three. I was guarding her, and she shot a three. And I remember contesting the shot, and then looking back, and she missed. And like all the confetti coming down, you know, the the Queen song come up. We are the champions. Kara Lawson grabs the the game ball, jumps on the score table. I mean, it was ridiculous. Then we go in the locker room, champagne everywhere. Uh, at the time, the Maloofs, they were our owners, also yeah. the owners of the Kings. They had a hotel like in Vegas, the Palms. So the next day we all flew to the Palms and they just took care of everything. So yeah, it was it was crazy. It was insane. Did you have some bragging rights over uh, over Chris Webber and and uh and uh like Jason Williams and Page and all yeah, that? I think they were happy for us. And then when you see like um how the city just um, got behind us then we yeah. had a parade you know it was so cool and I mean I really wanted that for them you know because yeah. when you win and they were like our brothers you know we we used to go to each other's games and support each other and um, you know when you and you feel like you're that close but again like you're that close this year doesn't mean you're going to win next year it gets harder and harder every year um, and I really feel bad because I thought they had the the, the right pieces to, to win a championship and they were this close but it never happened. Yeah, I mean, I miss I miss that era of basketball, like that era on both sides. I mean, the WNBA and and the NBA. I mean, it was some of the best basketball I think of of, of all time. Yeah. Now, what what was your favorite WNBA arena to play in? I mean, you can MSG. You have, um, like you said, the Staples Center, now the, the the Crypto Center. There were so many other places. So, what was your favorite arena? Like, where did you like circle? Like, yo, this this is going to be exciting for me to play at. Well, at first we played the forum, so where yeah. the Lakers used to play, right? So I think that one for sure, uh, and then eventually they moved to the Staples Center, but I still play at the forum, and then you know Madison Square Garden is the mecca of basketball, and we all know. And um, actually, 1999 it was the first time that we had an All Star game, and it was at the Garden, and we in the Houston sang the national anthem. Wow! So that's like engraved in my memory forever, and that's probably like you know, like one of the best moments uh, of, of my life to have Whitney, you know, singing the national anthem and for us to have the first all-star game at the garden was, was unbelievable. Now your playing style is, is like no other, you know, your passing, your creativity, the way you, your vision, the way you see the ball. I mean, like you said, you, you talk about, um, you know, Jason Williams and, you know, some other people, Jason Kidd. Um, I, I mean, I, I look at you and I, I compare you more to like, uh, like Milos. I know you're Milos Teodosius. Like I see like yeah. the style that you guys, you guys play with. Um, so first of all, where does that come from? I mean, you mentioned it a little bit before, but you know, how do you hone those skills? Like, I mean, how are you, are you, you know, in the, in the, in the basketball court and just throwing behind the back passes? Like, how does that like creativity come? Is it just something that's just natural or it's just like, how, like, how do you see, like, I, I, I grew up Milos and I grew all these point guards all the time. Like, how do you see these passes? How do you see this stuff? Like, where does it come from? I don't know. I really feel like it's natural. I almost compare it to somebody that can sing or they can uh, draw really well. It's something that you are born with, right? And I, I just feel like I just enjoyed playing basketball. I enjoyed, um, I had fun when I did, yeah. when I played. And playing with the boys, like I said, growing up with the guys, uh, I think because I didn't want to get my shot blocked, I just developed like a passing, you know, it was like my 
<laughs> the defense mechanism. I'm like, I'm you guys are not blocking me, so I'll just pass it. But a lot of it was just um, it just came natural. I mean, you can go work on your free throws and your shooting, your dribbling, but on your passing, especially if it's like crazy passing, it's all just uh, my vision, my creativity, and then having amazing teammates, obviously, and coaches that gave me the green light and let me let me be free and play um, the best way that I could. And it's just having fun. Sometimes if I had a coach that put too many rules and don't do this and don't do that, then I would like not be myself. So, you know, obviously basketball is a team sport and to have people around me that let me play and let me be myself and then teammates that can catch my passes. Although I did hit a lot of people in the head. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and I have uh, issued my apologies to them. It was mostly <laughs> practices, but then he's like, you know, KYP, know your personnel with her. <laughs> you don't throw it behind the back or no look but uh yeah i just had fun fun playing and um you know and it was great did you ever i'm sure you have but did you ever have passes or highlights that like shocked you and and what would you say was your the top pass or top assist of your career so i mean there's a few um and then like if you go on youtube or whatever and you see my top top passes like the first one is actually the candace parker when you play in la and uh and I actually don't know what I did in the game. And then really? I had to watch it again. And I'm like, what did I do? Oh, okay. You know, so sometimes, you know, it would just happen and it goes so fast. And I wasn't really sure what I did. And then uh, when I watched the replay, I was like, oh, okay, that's what I did. Yeah. <laughs> I can, I can, it's almost like an audio, uh, out of body experience, I guess you yeah. could say. Like that. Yeah. yeah, because, you know, it goes by so fast and you just see somebody open and you try to give them the ball. And sometimes the best way is a no look or bounce pass or a spin move or whatever. Like, and, you know, I always put a little extra mustard and ketchup on the hot dog for sure. So <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Now I want to get to before we I want to do a little pause on the WNBA and I want to get to your professional overseas career. Now you, you come overseas. Now, what is the difference? Because people always talk about the difference between the NBA and and your league or whatever. But what is the difference between playing in the WNBA and playing in a professional overseas, you know, for for uh, for women's players? I mean, besides the rules that are like slightly different, uh, I think the, the WNBA is a little bit more physical. We also have more games uh, in a week. So um, WNBA, sometimes we play three, four times a week and uh, overseas we play twice, you know, EuroLeague and then in the domestic league. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, it's, it's very similar. Uh, I think the skill level of Europeans has gotten closer to, to Americans and some are have surpassed. I mean, and you look in the NBA, some of the best players are Europeans or are foreigners, right? Um, so uh, it's very similar. It's not as as um, a huge gap uh, as it was before. Um, so I definitely enjoyed um, both leagues, you know, the WNBA and the, and overseas. But the hardest thing was definitely like finishing one and starting the other, and then finish finishing overseas and starting WNBA. So you basically have no off season mentally and physically. is very draining. But also knew that I had this window to play professional basketball. And I wanted to capitalize and just uh, play as, as many years as, as I could. And, and, and that, that was on both leagues. Now, how do you manage that? Because, uh, you know, I, we get a little, you know, our eight week um, summer vacation and all of us are complaining like, you know, oh, we need more time. But like you said, you know, you, you, you go from one season and you go directly to another. Now, how do you manage that? Like, how do you manage, you know, as far as like your body and nutrition and then also just relationships with people because you're all over the place. And I know it's sure it's like you, you meet one person and you meet another teammate and you're going here, you live, you know, you live in one apartment then you're going to the next apartment. And so how do you kind of manage that? And how did you uh, uh, deal with that? I think a lot of mental strength, um, mm-hmm. knowing that this is what I wanted to do and try not to complain and just really have a blessed mentality and thankful mentality because it's so easy sometimes when you start complaining about stuff and it's like a snowball effect and all of a sudden you just turn into this big complainer and crier and, uh, and whiner and I didn't want to do that. I, I knew that um, this is the what I chose uh, to do and, um, and I wanted to do it to the best of my abilities. And it is true, you know, you make a lot of personal sacrifices, you know, being away from family, um, you know, always hopping around, it's tough to have a relationship because you 
always like on the go. Mm-hmm. So all those things, you know, um, you know, looking back, I probably would have done the same thing. I don't, I don't have many regrets in the way that I, I've, I've taken my steps um, because I knew that I cannot do this when I'm 50 or 45 or 40, you know, this is the time to do it. Um, and because I love basketball so much, it was like, I was married to basketball and this yeah. is my priority. This is what I have to do right now. And then there's other, there's other times to do other things, you know? And uh, so that's kind of how I looked at it. And the days, and I tell my players that now, you know, the days that you don't feel well and you ask, what am I doing here? You know, log into your bank account, look at your statements. <laughs> that's why you're there. This is your yeah. job. <laughs> yeah, that's the running joke, uh, you know, uh, everybody says, like, you know, you're depressed until the tough hits. And then once that, once that yeah. thing hits, and everybody's like, hey, keep it going. <laughs> yep, exactly. So, but yeah, I mean, it's tough. It's tough. You definitely have to have the right mentality. I mean, I was born in Europe. I was European, so... Um, sometimes overseas is not for everybody, but maybe because I was from over there, uh, I had a different mentality about it. And again, I didn't want to like skip a season. Sometimes I would be like, you know what, maybe I don't go until Christmas or I'll go in January. So after the WB season, I'm going to take a break two weeks after the WB season, I was going crazy. I was so bored. Like all my friends work. Like, I'm like, I have to work out for free. I'm like, no, I'm I'm good. I'm ready to go. (laughs) Yeah. What was your favorite country that you played in? Oh, man. Favorite country and culture and food and fashion, probably Italy. But Absolutely. Yeah, I know you know. But uh, but I think Russia. I, like when I played in Moscow, um, yeah. we had a crazy owner. He was like a billionaire. We traveled private. Like yeah. We played in five-star hotels. Like, I mean, we made really good money. We had a amazing team so uh i think as experience as a whole and we want everything you know so that was and moscow was amazing i mean i hate the cold that's why i live in miami but but i never really felt cold because i had a driver so i would just run into the car and then got dropped off at the restaurant at the gym at the mall whatever so i never really felt like the minus 30 or minus 40 that was outside yeah. so I think, and I also love Istanbul. I played for Galatasaray um, half a season, um, and I really enjoy Turkey. So Istanbul is one of my favorite cities in the world. Um, But I really enjoyed and I really would try new uh, dishes and experience their culture and really try to be outside the box and, um, you know, not just go home and put my music on and just be my little, little world. I was like, I have an opportunity to see the world for free, to meet new people, and why not really take advantage of it? So that's always was my mentality. I love that. I mean, I, I lived in Moscow for seven years, and I played mm-hmm. with uh, played with Seska, and and Moscow is to me is my favorite city because it was it was a surprise. Um, yeah. you know, going, you 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 hear so much about Russia, and you hear so much about you know what Moscow or what is what is supposed to be, and then you get there, and it's completely different. It's like you know going to the metro, you know going to the the Red Square, and, and doing all the different type of stuff. And like Moscow, we kind of became like you know my my favorite city it was almost yeah. like that the time. best restaurants yeah. in the world are in moscow the malls the shopping yeah. i mean everything was just crazy but again if you just think oh it's cold outside i don't want to go anywhere then you'll never find about those things right but i definitely enjoyed moscow a lot and i, I heard the uh so i think sue i think it was uh sue bird and diana trossi they had the 30 for 30 and they were talking about the, the all the crazy stories on order and i heard even more behind the scenes like i said when i was in russia and all the stories and stuff like too so I mean, you guys definitely, uh, you know, definitely had a great time. <laughs> yeah, uh, we did. <laughs> what was what was the experience like? You know, um, this is my last question about overseas. But what was the the experience like? You know, winning all those titles and winning all those championships. Um, like you said, you you won many in in, in so many different countries. Um, so how would you compare that to the feeling of winning in the WNBA? Is it is it a comparison or is it you know all all the same? Winning is winning. I was lucky because I always play a little bit like you always play in competitive teams overseas, right? So um, because I was also European, I could have two more Americans um, on my team. And um, I mean, the goal was every team that I went to, it was always to win the championship. So in that regard, I was lucky because, you know, you're competitive and you want to win. So you don't want to go into a situation where the goal is to make the playoffs, you know, like that was not acceptable, right? So um, winning never gets old. So it doesn't matter if it's in Czech Republic, in America, in China, I mean, winning, it's what you what you play for. Um, and I mean, winning the WNBA championship, I think is the hardest just because the league is so, and it, it's gotten more and more competitive. There's more parity in women's basketball. You can see it in college and now you can see it in the WNBA when 
the league starts, you really don't know who's going to win. I mean, Chicago won last year and they were a 500 team. A 500 you know? team. So, yeah, so it's really up in the air. Um, but I, the WNBA is the hardest uh, championship to, to win for sure. Now we want to jump forward to your, to your new career. Um, mm -hmm. you're, you're a sports agent, um, you know, representing, you know, WNBA players. Um, so first of all, um, I don't know what that was, but uh, first of all, um, what made you want to get into the sports agency business? Um, you know, there's, I guess, even previously before, there weren't a lot of former players that were sports agents. A lot of times it was, you know, you know, a lawyer or, you know, somebody or a friend or friend of somebody else or, you know, some other, you know, some other individual. I always, everybody always thinks of the Jerry Maguires, you know, those are always kind of like the crypto prototypical kind of sports agent. So what made you want to become a sports agent rather than getting into coaching or front office or, or something else? Uh, I felt like being a point guard, I kind of coached all my life. So I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. And I kind of wanted to step away from being on the court. And uh, to be honest with you, I was like, I know that I want to stay involved with the game. It's my first love is what I love to do. So I cannot like walk away and I want to pay it forward and be able to do something. So women's basketball continues to grow. But then the second thing was like, I want some type of freedom. Yeah. I And being an Asian gives me that I can really be anywhere as long as I have my phone and my computer I can do my job from anywhere in the world and uh and have a little bit of freedom you know my parents are getting older they still live in Portugal so it's important to me to to be able to to go there when I want to and spend as much time there as possible uh I left home when I was 16 so they missed so much of you know my life and, and vice versa so to me now there's other things that are important you know I want to uh live to work you know like I I want to work to live. I, I don't want to like spend all my life and being a coach, you watch so much film and you have to like, you know, it's, it's crazy. Like you have no life, like literally. So I was I knew I didn't want to coach. And at the time there wasn't too many women representing women that definitely played the games. So I just felt like I could, you know, give back and not just be an agent, but also a mentor and help, you know, these young women transition from college to the pros, uh, give advice by experience. I literally have been in their shoes, so it's easier for me. And, um, you know, I, I do love my job. It's, um, it's been good to me. Uh, it's a little bit cutthroat, you know, and uh, sometimes, you know, people associate agents with being, you know, bad people and liars and all that. And I'm like, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm honest. I'm, I'm, I'm very, um, you know, transparent. Uh, and the day that I even think about doing anything like that, I'll just walk away because that's not for me. So, How long did it take you to feel comfortable in this, this new profession, this new role? Um, you know, like you said, you've been playing all your life. You've been on the other side all your life. So, you know, how long did it take for you to not get out of the routine, I guess you can say, um, to, you know, like you said, want to just be, you know, live a normal, you know, almost a normal lifestyle? Yeah, it was it was a smooth transition. So I retired in 2012 in September was my last game. And then I became an agent in 2013. Uh, I already knew. So I was getting ready, like my last year, I was getting ready to, you know, be FIBA certified and then WMBPA certified. So I took all the necessary steps by the time I finished, you know, I didn't want to have this thing like, okay, what do I do now? A lot of people go into this um, big question mark. Okay, I finished playing, what do I do now? And a lot of people go into coaching because I feel like that's the easy thing to do, but I don't necessarily know if it's their passion. So I wanted to do something that I was passionate about. Uh, and I didn't know if I was going to like it or not. Obviously, I've dealt with amazing clients and amazing players that have made my job easier. Um, but yeah, it was it was a smooth transition. Uh, obviously, I've gotten better, just like anything in life. Uh, but um, the thing to me is like, I'm not like super aggressive. And I'm like, I'm not giving you all these lies and promises and blah, blah, blah. Like, this is me. This is our agency. We would love to represent you. I think we can do this, this, and this for you. So hopefully you can come, but I don't really be kissing butt and all that. Like, that's not me. I'm, I'm going to be true to who I am. And hopefully that's enough to, to sign the players that are meant to sign with me. How was your, uh, your first client recruitment uh, beating? And who was your, your first client that you signed? Yeah, so I signed Leisha Clarendon. She's still uh, playing at the WNBA. She played for um, for Cal Berkeley, and they went to the to the final four that year. Uh, so yeah, it was easy. I mean, just talking to her, talking to the family, uh, and I think you know sometimes the people can sense 
I never thought my name was going to be enough to sign players. So, yeah. but I think once I start talking to them and talking to the parents and the family, I think a lot of them enjoy the fact that I've done that and I know what it takes to, to be a successful basketball player, you know, especially with overseas aspect to it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and some uh, uh, parents actually feel very comfortable with that. And, um, and I feel like they sense my transparency and that's something that I've, you know, I've gotten a lot of compliments on just how transparent I am and uh, just trying to keep it uh, 100, like they say these days, right? <laughs> <laughs> like the kids say. Um, yeah. What you talked about a little bit before, but for, you know, younger listeners or, you know, younger athletes that are looking that are, you know, maybe want to be professional, what would you say makes a successful sports agent? Uh, communication, being transparent, always make sure that you tell the truth. Uh, um, always make sure that you put your client first. It's not about you. It's not about how much money you can make. It's about their needs and uh, what it's appropriate for them, especially overseas, for instance. I'm not going to you know, push you to go to Russia because I get a better commission. Sure. I know that you hate the cold and you're not going to be successful there. So my job is to bring you option A, B, C, D. Also getting to know you, uh, the better I get to know you, the better I get to know you as a person and your needs and goals and all that stuff, the better job I can do. Uh, but definitely communication and being transparent and having somebody's back. Uh, I think that that's important. Would you like to see, you know, more women um, you know, representing other women in the in the in the space. Um, when or... I first started, there weren't many, but I think now it's it's growing. So there are some other female agents out there. We even have a, a female agent in the NFL and yeah. a few in the NBA. Uh, so I love to. I mean, it's not about if you were female or male. It's about oh, yeah. your skill level, about your your knowledge, about your passion. Uh, and I think you know, I, I think it's great. And I love that, especially in the NFL, which is like such a a strong like uh, yeah. <laughs> sport. Yeah. And you know, and for for those guys to pick a woman, you know, to represent them, I love it. Absolutely. Do do you see yourself making the? I shouldn't say crossover. We're making a transition to maybe representing NBA players. I don't think so. I think I'm going to stay in this lane. I, I like it. It's, it's definitely women's basketball is my passion. And the women, the men's side is like a completely different world, mm -hmm. you know? Um, um, so I think for now, I mean, I never say never, but for now I, I like where I am and then I'm going to do it a, the best, the, the best job that I can, but you know, in five years or something like that, maybe I want another challenge and maybe I will go down that lane. You actually, uh, you represent my cousin, uh, Maisha Hines uh, Allen. Yeah. Yeah, 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 she's in Bologna this year. Yeah, so she, she's awesome. she's a free agent, so uh, yeah. so yeah, she's been busy. This I, uh, I just texted her this morning. Yeah. yeah, yeah, she deserves it. She deserves it, man. She's yeah, she's great. Exactly. I said, you know, take this as an ego booster if you want to. You know, yeah. like all these things want to talk to you because everything that you've done up to now, and this is your first time being a free agent, so don't freak out. This yeah. is a good thing, so enjoy it. Uh, just talk to teams, and then we're gonna figure out what's the best situation for you. That's love, and I'm, I'm hoping uh, hoping the best for her. Yeah, for sure. Now, I have a couple last kind of like quick shot questions. Um, you know, the first question that I have is, um, how would you how would you summarize, and how do you feel about the current state of women's basketball? Uh, I, I think it's definitely. I mean, compared to where where I, when I started, I think you have taken a lot of steps forward. Sometimes it's baby steps, but even with the WNBA, the last CBA that uh, the players signed with the union and the league uh, has gotten you know much better as far as salaries and as far as other things that were uh, in need. You know, like uh, a woman gets pregnant and then she can get cut. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a lot of things that have changed. Uh, but there's still so much more room to grow. I never compare the NBA to the WNBA. I don't think it's a fair comparison, uh, especially when it comes to salaries. Sure. Um, the WNBA, it's 25 years old. The NBA is 20 and 75 years old. Yeah. So sometimes it's a lot of people like that comparison. I think it's apples and oranges and I don't compare it. Uh, but you look at women's basketball in college, how the parity is like every year, a different team has won a championship. It's not UConn, UConn, UConn anymore. Sure. So, uh, so it's, it's good to see. I think it's growing. Uh, I think little girls now can dream about the WNBA and they know it's real. It's here to stay. Um, and they can start, you know, getting their shooting coaches and their 
PTs and all that stuff preparing to, to be in the WNBA. It's a dream that can become a reality. Uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased with the way that, that we're going. I mean, there's a lot of good players out there in high school and in, in college. And now with social media too, you know, you can advertise yourself and you have a better understanding of what, what's coming, you yeah. know, the new way of players. And there's a lot of good players out there. Some, some of them generational players that will have a big impact, not just with their schools, but also in the WNBA eventually. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, just the talent. I mean, I think you can see the talent. I mean, you look at, you know, the, the players in high school and middle school and, you know, different things. And like you said, with social media, you know, just there's girls in high school now that are dunking and, you know, doing all this different type of stuff and making, you know, moves. And it's, it's incredible. It's incredible to watch. Like I'm a, I'm a absolute big fan of, you know, watching it and hopefully that the, the game continues to grow. Like I'm a big advocate of that. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're on the fast break, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to throw a no look pass. It's a two on one fast break. Who is okay. the one person in the history of all basketball that you would want to throw a no look pass with a two on one fast break to? You're trying to put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to go with the easy answer, I guess, because she was one of my favorite teammates. Uh, yeah. She was just inducted into the Naismith Hall of Fame, Yolanda Griffith. And, you know, if uh, she had the best hands, probably of all the players that I've played with. So I'm just going to go ahead and say her. So um, if she's watching this, I don't get in trouble since she <laughs> wasn't my teammate. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, your favorite European player of all time, male or female? Oof, that's a tough one. I mean, there's so many. Um, Oof. I mean, there's Evan Mkova from Czech Republic. She also played a little bit in the WNBA. Um, Maya Valdemoro from Spain. Oof. I mean, there's there's so many. It's really hard. Laya Palau, she's still playing. She's like 40 years old. She's still playing in Girona right now. And she's um, she's been one of the top uh, point guards uh, in the league. So um, Zazunskaya from Russia. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to just pick one. So I'm going to plead the fifth on that. <laughs> <laughs> favorite and i don't know how or i don't know if this is a political way to answer this but your favorite current uh women's basketball player to watch should i say non-client am i allowed to say that um yeah maybe that, that let's go that route you know what i'm just gonna go out there and uh, say sue word just because okay. of I mean, she's 40 years old. She's still playing at the highest level. She's a point guard, which always have a special place in my heart. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that uh, she has won so much. Uh, I mean, a resume, it's crazy, but she still has the same hunger. And that's one thing that is really hard to, to keep up, you know, to, to have the same desire to win and to stay uh, in the top of your game. Um, you know, so that, that's an easy one because she's about to be the oldest player in the WNBA, but the way she plays, you would never say that. And, uh, you know, she's somebody that I respect immensely. Yeah. Last question I have for you, um, and maybe the most important question is, you know, advice to future, um, you know, professional players, WNBA or NBA, our, our young listeners that listen, what would your advice be, you know, for them that, you know, want to have a successful, you know, career, um, successful, you know, whatever success is to them? Um, you yeah. know, basketball court. Well, there's a lot of things. I mean, it's like making a cake. There's a lot of ingredients that you have to have in order to make a nice cake, right? You can't just have sugar or flour. You have to have a lot of things. But I mean, the, the most important thing is that you believe in yourself. I, I think that uh, sometimes you're going to have people that even sometimes your friends or your family, they, I mean, maybe my friends say, don't go to America. Like, what are you doing? Like, you know, but I always believe in myself. I always believe that, you know, like you mentioned before, I always tell little kids to dream big. Um, and I think that's what you have to do. You have to believe in yourself and then have really big dreams but then you have to work you have yeah. to work extremely hard um you know to to make those dreams come true they nothing is gonna um fall from the sky you really have to put in the work in order to go to where you want to where, where you want to go and uh, and you have to make a lot of sacrifices i think these days there's so many distractions you know with social media and like video games and this and that and the other and I was so focused I knew exactly what I wanted to do and where I wanted to be and nobody was gonna you know defer me from uh from being able to to get there um so that that's the thing you know like dream big um believe in yourself and really work extremely hard um you know to accomplish all those dreams oh 
I mean, that's that's important advice. So I, I thank you so much. I personally thank you so much. I mean, you you've been, um, you know, as somebody that's been a fan of all basketball, it's it's been really great to have this conversation with you. Um, it's been really great to watch you throughout your career, watch you throughout your your journey. Um, you know, as like I said before, the things that you've done in, in life with the, you know, Special Olympics and, you know, how you're, you know, so committed to your, your, your country in Portugal and, and so many other different things that you, you have done. Um, I just want to say thank you, um, you know, to all, you know, for all of us from the basketball community. Um, you continue to be an inspiration and, you know, thank you for taking the time. Like I said, I know you have a busy schedule, like you said, free agency is, is looming and you have, you know, a lot of clients and different things going on and you're in Miami. So I'm sure you'd rather, you know, be you know, <laughs> on the beach or doing something else. So um, yeah, I, just, I actually yeah. went to the heat game tonight because I have a friend yeah. of mine that's working for Portland. So I was like, you know, I, I actually don't like going to the games. I'd much rather stay home. And like, but once in a while, I don't mind. And she's just got the position with the Portland Play Trailblazers. So she's in town. So I said, okay, I'm going to come and support you. But yeah. So, uh, but um, no, thank you for real. Um, I mean, I, it's good to see uh, a, a guy like you that has been so accomplished on the men's side, but to be so respectful of the women's game and to have me as a guest. Um, I'm always here to speak you know, basketball, to talk basketball and to talk about women's basketball. So thank you for the invitation. I had a blast. And uh, anytime you need anything from me, you already know, you can just ask me. So thank you. Thank you very much. Subscribe to the Players Podcast to listen to more conversations with your favorite player about their careers and interests off the court. You can also check out Upple TV and GTM Family Productions on YouTube for more content. Thank you for listening.